Hey guys, Jeff Francoeur here. Thanks for listening to our content and please like and subscribe. Before we get to the podcast, if you have middle school or high school kids that play sports and you don't want to fundraise like me, we got you covered. My buddy Chris Carneal owns Booster. Chris? We help schools and sports teams raise funds in a super fun and engaging way. In fact, the last 22 years, we've raised $750 million and we can't wait to help you. Choose Booster.com. Hey guys, Jeff Francoeur here with Pure Athlete. I am in the hotel room in Philadelphia and the two knuckleheads, Britt and Brad, are back on home base in Atlanta. Guys, uh, excited to join you today. Man, we are, we are excited. This week, is, uh, this week is pretty fun. The, the game the other night was unbelievable ending. <laughs> we, had it, we had it all the way, didn't we? Had it the whole time. <laughs> oh man, the the whole way. It's it's you know what we talk about in postseason baseball. It's incredible the fact that Zach Wheeler pitched so well and made literally one bad pitch, and the game was four to three. And that's how quick things can change in the postseason. It's, it's absolutely crazy how quick it happens. Well, it had to be fun for you guys, and and BA made an unbelievable call there at, at the end. But you guys set that up really well and man what a what a great showcase it was awesome and and my favorite yeah ba's call was incredible we've never seen a game in like that before on a ball that you know we're actually in game three going to kind of highlight some things because you know austin riley the fact that he was where he was uh, i mean the third baseman is not supposed to be there on that type of play but he just kept kind of following he was he actually said he was trying to tell ozzy or Arcia, whoever caught it, one 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 to try oh, to yeah. double up. And he said that all of a sudden he was like, well, I realized I was the one that was going to have to make the play. So uh, incredible finish. And now, of course, being up in Philadelphia, guys, I mean, all, all day Philly stuff everywhere. I went and got coffee this morning. And, you know, they are, they are fired up for postseason baseball up here. I'll tell you that. Well, Jeff, we, we know that, you know, you have to be unbiased you know, as a TBS oh, yeah. broadcaster, which I'm sure is tough because you've been broadcasting the Braves, you know, all year long. But uh, but this is this is pure athlete. You don't have to be unbiased right here. So what, what's your take on the rest of this series? Well, I'll tell you a funny story real quick because of that. You know, you, you always you always know that, you know, trust me, I got you know, I'm not on Twitter. But I did get some DMs after the first game from some Braves fans that were like, you're a traitor. You know, you're, <laughs> you're pulling for the Phillies to win. So yesterday we get into Philly and actually me and Brian Anderson played golf out at the Philadelphia Cricket Club. It was a beautiful day. And we were walking up the 13th fairway and coming down the other side of the 12th was a Phillies fan. And he yelled, Frank Core, you played for the Phillies in 15. He said, you sounded like a Braves fan the last two innings in game two. And I, and I told him, I, I said, well, I said, you know, the action kind of takes you. I said, what did you think about game one? And he said, you were great in game one. And I'm oh, like, yeah. of course, because the Braves only got five hits and they're all singles. It's tough. You know, it is. But at the end of the day, I, I love doing, doing the postseason stuff. And two years ago, I was able to do Braves Brewers. Braves Dodgers and at the end of the day I'm going to talk about the action and you know both sides have so many good stories and I mean if you watched game two I talked about Zach Wheeler up mm. and down for oh, six yeah. innings and how could you not yeah, I mean tired they, of it. even if I was <laughs> I like yeah, exactly but if you're doing a Braves game if you're doing a Braves game right regular season how are you not talking about Wheeler in that game even if you're a Braves announcer so you know what it's a lot of fun you have to take it with a grain of salt you know you're going to make some Phillies fans mad. You know you're going to make some Braves fans mad. But I think at the end of the day, the one thing I wish this series was, guys, was seven games. Because I think this is the two best teams in the National League. Yep. And, I mean, th these games up at Citizens Bank are going to be incredible. And if there's a game five back in Atlanta Saturday night, I can only imagine what it's going to be like there. It, it's, it really should be seven games. And we'll talk about that in a, in a second in terms of format. But... But like, yeah. what's your thoughts on the Dodgers and the Orioles having amazing years and getting knocked out so quickly? Or the Orioles getting knocked yeah, out, the, the Dodgers in jeopardy getting knocked out? The Dodgers are the surprise to me. I will tell you this, the Orioles, look, as great a season as they had, 
And I have a feeling I will be doing them next year in the American yeah, League young. for TBS because they're, thank you, Brett. They're young. Some of those guys were inexperienced. And even Brandon Hyde, if you remember, they got his facial expressions in game one. I'm not going to repeat because this is a family <laughs> show, what he said. But it just kind of shows you when you're young and inexperienced, that kind of happens. On the other side for the Rangers, you have Bruce Bochy, who's been in a million postseasons, won three World Series. And so he's able to do it a little better. The Dodgers, on the other hand, Kershaw, game one, they, they got, I mean, he got hit hard. I was surprised in game two. I thought the Dodgers would come out and the bats would get going game two. But, you know, it's a, no different than kind of the Braves. Look, the Braves for six, seven innings, their bats didn't do anything. And lucky for them, the last two innings, you know, they got a, a, a couple home runs. But that, that, Britt, when you go into talking about, and Brad, the, the format, because they're not going to take a playoff team away, okay? That's they're, they're not going to go back to the old format because there's too much money involved. But they got to do something, right? Do, oh, yes, and you cannot do a one-game series for two wild cards because imagine if the Marlins just played an outstanding game the other night and knocked out Philly. F Philly deserves to be in this playoff, deserves to be doing this. So what I've said, and I'm, and I'm hearing that there's already talk about it next year, is changing the NLDS to a seven-game series. Mm. Yep. Mm. And I think if you do that, look, if you come out game one, you're not ready, you haven't played, you still have plenty of time. I mean, even think about the Dodgers right now. If they were down 2 nothing, they still feel with their firepower and their offense, they have plenty to come back and win four games. Unfortunately for the Dodgers now, you, you have to win three before you lose one. Yeah, so yeah. it's a whole different – and the Braves were so close to being the same kind of part of that until they had that late comeback. So I love the format because more teams are in the postseason, but I do think that you will see a seven-game series in the NLDS come up, and I think it should be. So, Jeff, let me ask you this because you're, you're a former player. You know, all of us non-former players are, are talking about this all the time. But what's the reality yeah. of you haven't hit against real pitching in a real game in a week? Is that is that legitimately difficult? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think about back when I would take – you'd play Sunday and you'd have the all-star break and you wouldn't play till Friday. Those first couple ABs on Friday, they felt foreign. I mean, they did because as baseball players, your creature's a habit – you're, you're doing stuff every single day. And so I think that's why you've seen the bats struggle. I mean, the fact that game one, the Braves put zero runs up, the Dodgers put two late, and the Orioles only put up two. And so it's like, here you go, all the three of the most powerful offenses in baseball, and they scored a total of four runs in, in that first game. So I definitely think there's, there's something to be said for it. And um, the hard thing is, look, if you're the Braves, you can't make excuses. If you're the Dodgers, you can't make excuses. And, you know, but I do think MLB is going to do something about this because, again, I think a best of seven gives those teams a chance because, like I said, you're not taking a playoff team away, and you, and you definitely have to do two out of three. You can't just do a one game, you know, flip of the coin uh, when you have two series going on like that. So I think the best of seven is the only thing you can do to make it fair. And I mean, an MLB and television want the best brands out there too. They want the best teams playing late into the season. Oh yeah. I mean, they don't really love, they love one game upsets, but they don't like series upsets. I'm imagining they want, they want the, the Dodgers. They want, they want the Phillies, the Braves playing later in the season if they can. Yes. So yeah, you absolutely do because those are the teams that have the best players or the ones that do it. And you feel that the more games you play, and I also said this, guys, obviously Charlie Morton got hurt and the Dodgers, but if you do a best of seven, the advantage to me is then that the, the, the number one and two seeds, the reason most of the time they're going to be the one and two seeds is because they're going to have the deepest pitching staffs. They're going to have the deepest bullpen. And so in a seven-game series, that usually becomes the advantage. And so that's why I said, but think about this. We almost had the Braves down 2 nothing, the Dodgers down 2 nothing, and it would have been the second year in a row that you're looking at the one and two seeds both gone before the NLCF. So, you know, look, I, I think there's – there. I love how baseball added a playoff team. I really do. I think it's brought so much energy in. It's been fun to watch the Diamondbacks. Corbin Carroll, yeah, some of these yeah. guys are finally – people are seeing them on a national level. 
you know, and I think it goes back to the days of the Angels. You know, no one ever got to see Mike Trout in the playoffs. If they were that six seed a couple times, you at least get to see your best player. So I love the idea. Now it just needs to be tweaked a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot to be excited about baseball for us Braves fans. Hopefully it's going to last a few more weeks. But um, but it's also football season. And we got a great guest coming up that uh, is, is really kind of an amazing underdog story. And uh, we're really, really excited to have him come up. Yeah, we, we really are. And uh, Jeff, sorry you, you couldn't join us uh, on this yeah. interview. But it was it was a great one, but we, we know you're otherwise occupied for the next few weeks. Yep, I'm sorry I missed it, guys. But, you know, some people got to work a little harder than you two do. You know, you're kind of there. I'm going to be up in the action tonight. Hopefully I don't get a snowball uh, like they did to Santa Claus back in the day up here in Philly. But, you know, I, I told you, so I played here in 15, and we were not very good. And the fan base was awesome up here. You know, there it's going to be a crazy crowd game three and four, but it's going to be a lot of fun and uh, looking forward to doing it and looking forward to, to listening uh, to, to our guest. And then I'll be back with y'all in about 10 days, man. And we'll be rocking and rolling. All right. Sounds good. Sounds man. great. Have a great week. Pull them through. Thanks guys. <laughs> Brown. I'm so excited today. We've got a great guest. Uh, he had a nine year NFL career. Uh, was a two-time winner of the Harlan Hill Trophy, which is really the Heisman Trophy in Division II. Uh, prolific career in high school, playing a whole bunch of sports, and we're going to dig into all of that. But uh, with all that, let me welcome to the show Danny Woodhead. Hey, thanks guys for having me. I mean, you made me sound probably better than I am, and that's what's always fun about doing <laughs> podcasts. They're going to they're gonna make stuff up and make you sound pretty awesome. So I'm into that. Yeah, I've actually I've actually got a list of about ten bullets that I could have gone through on the on the paper, but we'll we'll end up touching those as we go through uh, our discussion here. But what you know, before we jump into you sports, Danny, we just kind of wanted to find out you're retired from the NFL. Uh, what are you doing these days? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, half the time I don't know what I'm doing. You know, <laughs> no, I'm uh, I live in a in a suburb of Omaha called Elkhorn, Nebraska. My wife and I have been here for now 12, 12 ish years. And we have four children um, from ages 12 to six, two year increments. And man, I have never loved life like I love life right now. And, you know, I loved the game of football. It was my passion. Um, it's what I was built to do. But I will say this, I, I love, what I get to do now. I get to be a dad. I get to be a husband. And then I also play a lot of golf, a lot, a lot of golf. I'll be very honest with that. My wife's amazing. She's the one that actually pushed me to start playing more golf. And I compete in like the amateur level and I try to qualify for, you know, different national tournaments. And, and then also I find enough time to me and a, a good buddy of mine. We, uh, we help people uh, in, in, and advise them on how to or who to sell their businesses to. It's almost like a little business brokerage-ish, but um, we're just out there advising and we try to match make. And yeah, it's, it's a fun thing to do. It's I never wanted to do anything business in my life. Never had any interest in it. And I was I was built, I thought, to be a teacher and a coach. And now... What I am doing is still, it, it's crazy because you can coach people on what to do or help them or just provide information, but it's, it's all about building relationships and that's what I enjoy doing. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I do now. We, we stay very busy. I, I think weirdly we're busier now as a family than I was ever playing. Yeah. Yeah. And your oldest kid is, you told us before we came on is 12. Yes. So it's just going to get busier, man. Oh gosh. And it, and it's just now, I mean, with sports, just different activities. I mean, yeah. goodness gracious. Like, and, and then, and also I didn't even mention this, like we're very involved in our church and my wife and I lead a young adult group. 
like from ages 19 to 30. So it's like, we got a lot going on in our life. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't change what we're doing right now for anything. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I have to hone in a little bit. I know that we have a lot of dads who listen in, a lot of moms too. And I know all the dads probably, you know, leaned in when you said your wife kind of asked you to play more golf. How, how did you accomplish that? Guys, when I retired, so when I retired, I mean, you have basically a decade of doing what I did and it all being about me and I'm gone and she's at home with the kids and kind of running the show. And my nut, if you take a strengths finders test or just whatever it may be, just to see your strengths, number one was competition for me. And when I retired, we went through some weird times, um, marriage wise. Cause it's like, I'm home. And she's like, what are you doing? Here? Yeah. <laughs> like not in, a, not in a bad way. It's just like, she always told our friends and, and anytime we've shared like our story that like my competition was a strength of mine that God gave me. But then when I wasn't able to use that strength, she goes, you'd start competing at home and the competing at home in the marriage probably isn't the best thing. So she, she comes, comes to me one day and she goes, you need to start golfing just make sure you're golfing in the mornings and like during the week. And I look at her like, Whoa, like in, especially in college football, when you're like a, a Georgia, let's say, and you have uh Samford on the schedule and then you have Alabama the next week. Like I felt like I was in a trap game. That's what I felt <laughs> like. It was. Like, is this a trap game? Like, what do I need to do? Do I play that game or like what, what's happening? And it turned out she was being honest and it's, it's a, it's weirdly we we've shared. It's kind of been a gift God has given us golf is because it's gotten me out of the house for not a long amount of time. And it's longer than, but it's not a job. Um, especially when I, I wasn't working and it, and it was one of those things that has been very good uh, for our relationship. And some people are like, Oh, you, don't want to see your wife. That's, that's completely opposite. It's just, I have a strength that I need to, I need to, um, use. And then when I use it and I, I come home, like, I don't, I don't need to continue to use it. Yeah. Well, as a graduate, proud graduate of Sanford university, we've never, ever been considered oh, a trap game that. before. <laughs> yeah. So I appreciate that, uh, and, that plug and our, producer too. and our producer's a Sanford graduate. <laughs> I've had a daughter that went to Sanford. So, uh, yeah, it's, this I appreciate that, uh, movie. that respect oh, there. Goodness. Um, Hey Danny, let's talk about, uh, what was it like, uh, growing up in North Platte, Nebraska a as a kid? Yeah, it, it's a, it's a town of 25,000 people. Um, incredibly just hardworking people. Uh, the, the UP union Pacific, like, I don't know if it's headquarters or something, but it's like their main spot, main hub. I mean, it's in the middle of the United States. Um, and then I, I grew up with a teacher and a coach as a dad. My mom stayed at home with us and homeschooled us from kindergarten to eighth grade. So like my dad was a hard worker in order to, I mean, make ends meet. He painted houses in the summer. He did different stuff. So kind of like the town, I mean, my family was just, my dad was a hard worker. My mom, if, if we needed money, cause there were four kids and she homeschooled them all. She'd also do ironing for people. She, she was a seamstress would like do alterations. And so I always saw, you know, hard work. I, I saw hard work and, and then I had a dad for a coach and I mean, I was around sports, like I was around all sports. And so I had the, the sports aspect too. And that's all I ever did. That's all I loved. I, I mean, that's what my dad loved. So I, I, I loved my dad. I, I wanted to do the things that he had interest in. And, but, uh, my, my mom and dad also kept us incredibly grounded. I grew up in a home where our faith was number one. And no matter what happens, no sports, no nothing is going to get in the way of what matters most. And so, guys, I was incredible. I, the, the foundation base that my parents um, 
built or like instilled in me, I, I feel like I was cheating. Like I really do. I feel like going into my adulthood, I already had a lot of answers for certain things. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so along those lines, your dad was a coach. I, I tell how many siblings did you have? And, you know, and tell us, you know, when did you start playing sports and what did that look like? And kind of take us through that journey. So I had an older brother. He was two years older than me, a, a brother that was younger, that was five years younger. And then a little sister, seven years younger. Um, what it looked like is, I mean, we were homeschooled too. So like if, if I got my schoolwork done, I was going out to shoot baskets. Like if I didn't, then I wasn't getting any work in. So like there was some incentive to do your school because that always came before anything sports. Um, but yeah, I, I started playing. I mean, I, guys, I don't even remember. Like I really don't. It started with soccer though. I was probably six or seven years old. And then it just kind of, as I got older, I played basketball. I played baseball. I played football. and It was just a thing that that was kind of my way of life. Like that was my interest. And I, I would play a lot with older kids because my brother was two years older and, um, there was nothing better than playing against older kids. I still remember when I was a sixth grader, high schoolers would come over to the rec center to practice basketball. I would jump in, in those games because I wanted to play with, I I didn't, nothing against younger people. I just didn't really have that much interest in it. Like I wanted to play against the best. Um, but yeah, I mean, so that's how it was from probably six to seven. I played, um, soccer and I think T-ball. And then as I got older, I played third, fourth and fifth, no fourth, fifth and sixth of football. And then in seventh and eighth grade, since I was homeschooled, I wasn't allowed to play. So I didn't even play football and I just worked on basketball. Um, but really anything and everything that you could do athletically, I wanted to do. And I played. So, so Danny growing up, like who were your role models in terms of like, did you have other athletes that you kind of dreamed about? And then like, what were your dreams? Like, did you dream just about making your high school team or did you dream about, you know, playing in college kind of what, what was, what were you thinking back then? Let's say when you were like 10 or 11 years old. Yeah. I'd say the guy that I followed, um, and it's pretty easy to, follow him because he was so good was Barry Sanders. So like outside of, I would say number one, my dad was my role model. And then my older brother, like those, those come before Barry. But like, if we're going off of athletes that I watched, it was Barry Sanders. Loved watching him. I mean, Emmett Smith was great too, but like Barry Sanders was the guy. I mean, he made things happen. Like he didn't have great, he didn't have great lines. And so, so he was the guy that I kind of followed. Um, I would say, like, looking back, I wanted to play in the NBA or in the NFL. Everyone's going to say, oh, dumb dreams, right? Like, I mean, you know people that, that do that. They're like, oh, yeah, maybe find a plan B. And, I mean, yes, I understood that, like, not I, – I wasn't, I wasn't that dumb – like I, I understood that like you need an education too. Like it's not something that's like, oh, I'm going to get a degree in football. Like I, I knew that, but that that's what my aspirations were. I ended up playing in high school and um, ended up having a very good career. Ended up three years of all Nebraska. I end up player of the year in Nebraska, but I don't get any scholarships. I, I was able to set all these records or whatever. Um, didn't get any scholarships. So you're like, okay, like, what, what do I do now? Uh, I ended up getting a full ride from Shadron, um, which they didn't really do. And I don't know if they, I I still don't think they do because there's just not a lot of scholarships and we were at a lower level for D2, but I knew I wanted to go to Shadron if I didn't get an offer from Nebraska or something like someone legit. I remember Wyoming came in late and I remember talking to my parents I was already, I think I might've already been committed to Shatter. And I was like, I'm not going to Wyoming. If they offer me. Like, I was like, I, like, what am I going to go do? Play for a bad division one school? Like I just, at the time they weren't good. And I got to go play with my, my best friend, my role model in my brother, Ben. 
because he was a receiver at Chattern. So I, uh, yeah, that, that took me there. And then it's just kind of like, I don't know what's going to happen. Let's just try to, I, I literally was just trying to do the best I could that day. Like, you know, one step or one foot in front of the other. I really believed that. And, and my mom always, especially through the recruiting and like, it was hard for me not to get an offer from Nebraska like that, that bothered me. I'll, I'll be very honest because I was, I cried when we lost to Florida state in 93 in the orange bowl. I was happy as can be when we won in 94 against Miami in the orange bowl. Then the next year we beat Florida in the Fiesta bowl. A couple of years later, we beat Tennessee in the, I think it was the orange bowl also, but like, Guys, I was Nebraska through and through. So, like, that was hard. And I, the way I was raised is what got me through that. If I didn't have my relationship with Jesus, I have no idea what would happen because my mom always said, she said, walk through the doors that God has opened for you. Like, I'm not going to go try to break in a locked door at Nebraska. Like, why? Like, the, it makes no sense. Like, I'm going to waste my time trying to break the lock. There's a door open in Shatter and go through that door. So I went to Shatter and end up having a, a a good career and uh, didn't start the first two games, but played the first two games. First game had a, my first touchdown. Second game didn't start still, had over 100 yards. And then the third game I end up starting and I went for over 300 yards. And so from there on, things just kind of, the trajectory went crazy. and like you guys mentioned, end up winning Harlan Hills, uh, getting all the accolades. And I understand this too. I understand that regardless of what happened, I had to have 10 other dudes that were good. Like that as a running back, as a anything in a team sport, you better have some dudes around you. Well, I did. And, and they made life easier for me. And they made, made me use the abilities that God gave me of my quickness, my speed, you know, just whatever it may be. And so I would say after my junior year or into my junior year, I really understood that like, okay, this NFL thing, because I was always just like today, I just got to be better today. Got to be better today. My junior year is when I really understood that like, okay, this NFL thing can actually happen. Even at my, my roommate, he said one time we were just laying down and talking and and he goes, do you realize that you're putting up NCAA football, like in PlayStation video game number? And I go, huh? Yeah, that, that's kind of true. Cause I was averaging over like 200 yards, uh, end up going for almost 2,800 yards my junior year. And I was like, Oh man, like that's when I think everything hit me. And I was like, okay, this is real. And then, uh, I remember a scout coming in to time me like, my junior year just to like see where it's at my time. And I think I ran a really fast time. They didn't tell me, but I ran a fast time that day. And, and it, it was a Falcon scout. So I knew there was an opportunity. Then my senior year comes around, set the record for all divisions. And, and then end up getting hurt late in my season. And I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't know if that's going to mess with things, but at the end of the day, I'm going to do everything I can to, to get to the league. And, you know, fortunately I get opportunities to, I thought I was going to get invited to combine. Didn't shocker. Right. I mean, didn't get an offer. Didn't get whatever. End up Tom Osborne ends up letting me go to UNL cause he was the AD at the time. Did my pro day there. Uh, I ran in the four threes. There was a Jag Jaguar scout that came up to me and held up a four, two, eight to me. I think it was. And, he goes, does this surprise you? And I look at him and I go, no. And I think he like, I, I was thinking because of that, and, and it wasn't arrogantly, I just, I, I, I was pretty quick. And, and, and we come to this time, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to get drafted probably. End up not getting drafted. And, and it's just like, holy crap. Like, how many times am I going to just like not get an opportunity? Um. And I, I had 38 and a half inch vert. I had 20 reps on the bench for a smaller guy who was pretty decent. And I'm like, I just, uh, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I end up getting, not getting drafted. ESPN's at my house, at my parents' house. 
uh, don't get drafted, but I, I go undrafted to the Jets. And then kind of things went from there. I, I, I would say there was some two years of bumpiness, almost three, and, but it played out obviously how I, I wanted it to. Well, so you kind of glossed over your high school career. I, I want to go back yeah. a little bit because it was absolutely amazing. Um, you played four sports in high school, correct? Yeah. So I, I played, I played, I, t- I, you could only play three a year, but my junior year I went out for track because okay. I thought that would get me a scholarship and clearly that didn't work. <laughs> and how many, how many state, like a, how many different state records did you at that time hold or break or, or whatever in those sports? This is being very honest. I have no idea. <laughs> It was a lot, though. We read it was a lot. I wish I could be in the place where I don't even remember how many state records. It was more than (laughs) Yeah, more than I got. That's true. So, and and football was obviously your number one sport, even though you were doing these other sports. It was was the number one sport once I was done. Freshman year of high school, um, you they don't they don't bring guys up for football, and 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 I think my dad was a coach, and I I always say I go, Dad, I. I could have played my freshman year. And he goes, I don't know. But like that, that was something you didn't do. And I don't know if it's because, because we were a big, so we are the biggest class in Nebraska. It's class A. So it'd be like five A somewhere else or whatever it is. Um, So I don't know if that's part of it. They're like, ah, we don't want someone to get just destroyed. Right. But I was, I was built pretty good. And, but my freshman year, I ended up coming after, I ended up setting like some sort of freshman record. I think they said it wasn't like a record, like it wasn't in place, but everyone knew what the record was. And it was broken like four years earlier by a guy that was amazing. And I think I ended up breaking it. And so I knew I was pretty good at football, but I hadn't played seventh and eighth grade year. And I had been basketball. I was, I was pretty good at basketball and freshman year. I ended up getting brought up to varsity and they had never done that. They had never brought a player up. So I'm like, all right, this is cool, whatever. End up um, early on not playing a ton. And the next thing you know, I'm playing a ton. And I end up at our second leading scorer as a freshman. And they brought, they brought me off the bench instead of, I think it was because they didn't want a freshman starting districts. I end up starting and I go off for like 20 some. Um, but yeah, so that was my sport. And then in soccer, I get hurt early on, but I first JV game in soccer, I kind of kind of dominated. And then I hurt my hip flexor, was out for like um, three weeks or something. The first game I come back to play in was a varsity game and score. And I end up starting in soccer. So football was – I think was probably my best sport that or basketball. I don't know. Like, but like that was the one that I think after my sophomore year, I knew that's what I was going to do. So, so Danny, you were obviously, you're obviously gifted. God's given you a lot of physical gifts, but you've talked about work ethic. You've talked about this mantra of get better every day. When did that come into play? And, and what did, you know, h- how much of your success in high school is a result of just giftedness versus work? Yeah, I think that's tough. I mean, because you also had to have the teammates too. Like yeah, I yeah, said, so sure. like I had great teammates. It, it's hard because yes, it's work ethic, right? But I know the gifts that I've been given. It has its teammates too. And I think... I think it was like everything leading up. I don't think I could have done um, what I did in high school if I didn't do what I did when I was younger. If I didn't, it's almost like stepping stones, right? So it's like you have these little steps. It's like, okay, I'm pretty good. Like, oh gosh, like I averaged over 20 some as a sixth, seventh grader. Like I averaged almost 30 a game in the city league. Like, and they're like, okay, I'm good. It gives you confidence. And co- now you have to work, but there has, to, I, I really believe, and it's the way I'm built, 
like God's given me confident, like I, I'm very confident in what he's given me. And I'm very, um, I'm very comfortable knowing what he's given me. I, I, I feel very comfortable and confident in it. Um, but I think there was these stepping stones and, and then it was work ethic. I think it was the way I was built as in competition. Like you weren't beating me. And then if you did, okay, I'll shake your hand. But like, I'm the whole time. I think there's no chance you're beating me because that's just how I like, I'm not going to let you beat me. And so I think it's, it's just like a process and in each year you get more confidence, you get more of this, but I knew I had to work because my dad was a coach and my, my dad was not, he didn't push me into sports. Like if anything, he like, well, he, they always preach, whatever you do, be the best you can be at that. And that's like, if you're going to be a piano player, do the best that, that you possibly can at the piano. So like that was just instilled in me. Did that, did that play a, a huge point in me being good, my work ethic? Probably. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to say I'm the hardest worker ever because I don't know everything that everyone does. I, I was the hardest worker I could be. Like, I did everything I could. I don't, it's hard for me to judge if I'm the hardest worker. I don't know how other people feel. Uh, let's put it this way. When I was training for um, the NFL, I, I, I've told people this all the time. It's hard for me to go work out now and feel like I got a good workout in if I'm not puking. I used to almost puke before my workouts because I knew what was coming. So like the work ethic is a huge, huge thing because I don't think I get to where I was in the NFL if I didn't have it for me. And that's just speaking from me. Well, we, we had Austin Eckler on a, a month or so ago and a uh, similar story. He, I mean, he, he said kind of the same thing. He said, I, I don't, you know, I didn't compare my work ethic to other people, but I worked my butt off. I worked as hard as I could work. And uh, he, again, another, he's a smaller guy who's having a pretty, pretty good career. And kind of yeah. overlooked as well. Yeah. Also overlooked. Yeah. Um, I tell you what I love. And this is one reason that, that, that I wanted you on the show is that, um, I mean, <laughs> you did everything you could, it, I mean, to put numbers up, to, to show people that you were one could play in Nebraska. Obviously now people realize you probably could have played in Nebraska and done well for them. Uh, and you know, and then put numbers up obviously to, to play in the NFL and, and yet you felt like nobody was, I'm sure you felt like nobody was noticing you. You know, you were screaming from the mountaintops of, look, I'm, I'm putting up every number I can put up, stats, measurables, metrics, and no, and yet, and then it took you two years after that, your combine numbers were crazy, even though you didn't get invited to the official combine, but then you said two years of kind of just, you know, going back and forth in the NFL. When did you realize, when was the aha moment that, hey, I can play in the NFL, like I, I belong here? I think the aha moment was probably that first um off season. So as a rookie, um, we had this drill called the tackling drill and there were cones set up and you had like a certain width. And I remember, so you have off season OTAs, um, organized team activities is what they're called, but you do, you still do tackling. drill. You don't tackle, you just tag off. So it's like two hand touch. And I remember I didn't get touched until training camp. And most people like, I mean, you got to do something right to make a miss in that smaller area. And I didn't get touched. And that's when I was like, all right, like I played division two, but like the thing is the linebackers were just like safeties. Like it was just speed. So like people think it's like, Oh, D2's not talented. D2's really talented. There's people that just got overlooked and they were ball players. Now, the lines, not as not as good or not as big, not but it's like, I'm not worried about big. I'm not gonna overpower you anyways. 
Like, I'm not going to overpower a 290 pounder. So why is that going to matter? So once I got to the, the level that I got to, especially it encouraged me that just in t-shirts and shorts, basically, if I can beat them in t-shirts and shorts, I'm going to be fine. Like, I'm not worried about putting the pads on. People that worry that, like, then you're not quick enough. If you're not if you're not getting touched or whatever, like in these tackling drills, you should be okay. Because I, I mean, I was still built. I was still a big guy. Like I was not tall, but I was still a pretty big guy, pretty thick. And so I think that first off season, I was like, I'm good enough to be here. It's just am I going to get an opportunity? You say like getting passed up and never feeling like you're getting a chance. I mean, I felt like that in the NFL. Um. I felt like, so I tear my ACL that first year. That's what sucks in training camp. The next year I come back and I didn't feel like anyone could cover me. Like anyone. And I still didn't feel like I was getting opportunities. My third year, well, actually my second year. So after the ACL, I get brought up as a receiver. Not a lot of people don't know this, but I got activated at, on the active roster as a receiver because we were playing the Patriots and they wanted me to impersonate Wes Welker and they didn't real like in the kindest way, they didn't cover me. And, and I knew that if I would just get a chance, but it still felt like I'm never going to get a chance. I'm never going to get a chance. And probably the best thing that ever happened to me was in year three, I get cut because uh, New England signed me. Yeah, speaking speaking of New England signing you, so so you went to New England, you got a chance to play with Brady, you played under Belichick. T- tell us a little bit about that. What did you, you know, from a up close standpoint, what did you see different in those two guys as coach and quarterback? Yeah, so I, I will say this: I was prepared for that organization mm-hmm. with my first. Um, with the first regime in New York that I was with Eric Mangini. I mean, you guys, I'm sure everyone's heard of him and Bill, I mean, you know, not getting along afterwards, but uh, it was a very similar regime. And what you do in that, in both of those regimes is they rely on you to do your job. Just do your job. Don't do someone else's job because if you're going to do someone else's job, you're probably going to suck at your job. So like, so like don't, don't even go there. And so that's something that I respected and I respected the accountability is as fun as it wasn't at times because it was just stressful. You knew you were going to be good because everyone was going to be in the right spot every time. Otherwise they're not playing. Otherwise they're fired. It's the NFL. Those contracts aren't guaranteed. Like we'll just, they'll throw up the peace sign and send you on your way on a flight home. And I respected that. And in the, in the same way, I respected Tom because if you didn't do something right, he was going to let Bill and the other coaches know I can't trust him. So you might as well get a plane. You might you might as well get on a plane too. And I remember the first week I I got in there. <clears throat> I walk in Monday. Kevin Falk gets hurt the Sunday before, and we were actually playing the Jets when I got signed, thinking I'm going to come in and just. Tell him the whole offense. Well, Kevin Falk ended up getting hurt. I walk in. Bill tells me there's a chance. You know, we didn't think you're going to get an opportunity this early. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. Like nothing was promised. I'll tell you that much. We go into practice, and I go in for a few plays with the first team offense. And Tom is the worst to me. Like just dropping f's, doing like I'm like what. What is wrong with this guy? I thought he was the best of all time, greatest of all time, and he's just treating me terrible. Like, I'm just trying to help out. Like, I'm new here. And I think what I learned is he was just testing me if I could handle it, if I could handle him yelling at me. If, if anything, it made me more mad. I'm like, don't talk to me like that. I'm a grown man. Like, you, you don't need to talk to me like that. And that, for, that week, I learned that he was just making sure that I was ready and he could trust me on the field. And from there on, like we never had problems. I scored a touchdown that week. I scored a touchdown the week after and then had a big week against the Ravens um, 
couple weeks after. And from then on, I think he trusted me. But working with both of them is it's you do your job and you're going to be fine. You don't do your job, you're not going to have a job. For for all the folks listening, tell us kind of what what was your another aha moment when you stepped on the field at the Super Bowl? When it did you did it did it strike you as something special or was it another game to you or or I mean obviously you had a great game but kind of what was that feeling like? Yeah, that was nuts. I mean, I'm walking out on the field and it's like Phil Geisman's out there, Dion's out there, Michael Irvin's out there, Beyonce singing. Like, what? Where am I? You know, it was one of those things where, like, this is a little, uh, this is a little different than playing in uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico against New Mexico Highlands on a road trip. Uh, college. This is a, uh, this is this is a bigger deal, and man, you grow up in North Platte, Nebraska. You're working as hard as you can. Um, you get passed up every which way, and just to be there, it's like, oh my goodness. Like only this this plan is only planned out by God. Like this is like this is craziness. I'm playing in front of millions of people. And I get a I get to do what I'm I was what I felt like I was created to do at the highest, highest level. It it was it was bizarre, crazy. Um yeah, I, I don't even know. I don't. I don't even know how to explain. I think it's just you see all these people that everyone knows, and you know that this is the highest, biggest stage. That's really cool. Hey, uh, just a little bit more, and we'll finish up here, Danny. But I, I'm curious to ask you. You know, pure athlete is is all about helping kids. You know, leverage sports to become the best versions of themselves on the field, but also off the field. And one of our pil- pillars is character and character development, which we think sports provides a lot of opportunities for. I- I'm curious as you look back to your youth sports days, and I know maybe that's hard to separate from all the different areas, but w- w- you know, what in your character has been shaped uh, by sports? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, like, a lot of the lessons I've ever, ever learned was in sports. I mean, ever. There's, if, if you look at business, if you look at um, just any type of job you may have, sports, the things that happen in sports are going to happen in your next career or in your actual career if you're not going to play professionally. Like, a lot of times, there's winners and losers. Like I've lost in the business side, like just in my business, like where you think something's going to go through. Oh, and next thing you know, it doesn't. Well, that's a loss. And, and I think the most important thing is, and is, is how are you going to respond? Like, is it my job to be a jerk in the, in the losses? Is it my job to be a jerk in the wins? Um, I think it just, more than anything, it's and, – and this is typical coach's son, right? I My dad instilled in me that you're going to be a great winner and you're going to be a great loser. And, and that's how we're going to live our lives. Because at the end of the day, <clears throat> in jobs, whatever it may be, people aren't going to li- – they're not going to remember Danny Woodhead, the football player, I hope. I mean, there's going to be some memories, right? But – most of the people that I played football with or most of the coaches that coached me, they're not going to be like, man, Woodhead was fast. They're going to remember the, the daily things that I did. They're going to remember how in 2014 when I react to a broken ankle, how, how did he respond? Did he respond and just pout and, and not have a great attitude or did he come to work every single day with a positive attitude and saying, no, I'm, I'm going to find a way to get better through this injury. Or in, in 2000, um, in 2008, when I tear my ACL and I thought I was done, no, I'm, 
I'm going to do everything I can to show everyone that I'm committed to this sport and I believe I can play even as an undrafted guy from Shattered State. And I think it sports, sorry, I went to the NFL, but it's the same when you're younger. Like how, how, are, how are we going to respond in negative times? How are we going to respond in positive times? Like, hopefully, like, if you ask anyone, they see the consistency in everything that I did. Like, even when I was younger, like, man, hey, Danny, when you were setting all those records, was it about you or was it about your teammates? Like, it just show, like, it shows, um, it shows who a person is. I tell, I tell everyone all the time. If if you ask, uh, let's say I, Ivan Fears, he was my running backs coach in in New England. If you ask him what he thinks about Danny Woodhead, I hope his first thing isn't about football. I really do. I I hope he. It's like he was a hard worker. He was a good teammate. He was a um, a great man because being a good teammate translates in the workforce most of the time, unless you're just doing something only solely on your own. Like I don't, I don't know anything else in the world other than athletics that translates completely to like careers. Like, and, and I don't know this cause I, I was never in band. So there might be certain things that, or if you're a guitar player, maybe there are certain things I don't know, but like, I just feel like athletics, you, there's bad things that are going to happen at times. How do you respond? There's good things. How do you respond? So I think when you say character, I think it kind of tells every, you can watch someone in athletics over a course of one year, something bad's going to happen in a game or something not positive, even if they're the best. Um, even if you're in tennis and you're the number one player in the world, there's going to be a, a game where you're a little off. You might still win, but like, how did you react? And, and I think you, you can see someone's character. And if you don't have great character early on, you have opportunities to change that. And that's what's so cool is coaches can help parents also help form that person. And before they get into a career and they're a teammate or they're whatever it may be, hopefully by that time, they are molded into a, a better version of themselves. Britt, that was uh, that answer was probably the perfect definition of the pillar, the character pillar. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, wow, that was that was amazing. Um, last question, and I've got like twenty more, but I'm gonna try to give you one last question here before we go. Um, if there if if there's a kid watching right now who's undersized in a small town, but has big dreams, what's the best piece of advice? that you would give that girl or that boy uh, out there that's listening to this? Uh, don't listen to people. Don't listen to the, not don't listen to people because there's your coaches can be under that too, but your p coaches, you might not want to listen to them too. If they're going to give you negative feedback, unfortunately not all coaches are perfect. Um, if they're going to say you can't do something, do not listen to it. Um, I don't know how many times in my career, I, I was told that I wouldn't be able to do something. I, I remember freshman year of football, actually. I was going out and one of the kids on the team said, what position are you going out for? I said, I think running back. And they go, eh, we already have good running backs. I don't know if I do. Don't know if I do that. Well, if I would have listened to that person, I probably would have never been in the NFL because especially in the times that I played, a receiver's not going anywhere. Not in Nebraska. You were running the ball. And so what I would say is don't listen to people and don't let what people think of you dictate what you – dictate your thoughts of yourself. Because a lot of people will hear something and they'll be like, oh, yeah, I, you're right. I am too small. I, I am too small. If I would have listened to – I'm not going to say the name, but the coach at Nebraska at the time – he told me I was too small. He told me that maybe I could be a punt returner. If I listen to that man and I, I, I put it in my mind that I'm too small, that's going to be a detriment. 
I'm going to, because if you start listening to those negative things, you start believing them, whether you want to or not. If, if I would have, when I got released from the New York Jets, and if I would have believed, um, not, not going to name names, but people that said, um, yeah, you're so cool to watch. You worked so hard, so cool to, you know, see you live out your dream. And it's like, I felt like they were saying, I was like some charity, charity case. If I would have listened to that and been like, oh yeah, that was neat. I'm probably not playing the extra however many years. Because when you listen to this negative negativity, and I'm not saying you have to speak positive, like there's, there's some coaches that there's some tough love sometimes. But when there's just saying like you can't do things, sometimes you start believing them. And if you start believing them, you might as well cash it in. So I would just say don't listen to any of the negative comments or the negative things that people try to speak over you. Well, Danny, your story is uh, is super inspirational for for kids to hear, and uh, and we so much appreciate you coming on with us today. Uh, we're excited to see that you know you're still going to go for the U.S. Open qualifying in golf, and we hope to see you. Of course. Of course. Hope to see you out there soon. But, uh, again, thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. Danny, thank you so hey. much. This is great. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Hey, guys. Jeff Francoeur here. Thanks for checking out Pure Athlete. And subscribe to our channel on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you go to listen to our podcast. Right.